Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 to 16. One, two, three. Take, Take care, care lest you forget, forget the Lord your God by not, not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which, which I command you today. today. Lest, lest when you have, you have eaten and are full and, and have built good houses and lived in them, and when, when your herds and flocks multiply, multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied, and, and all, all that you have is multiplied. multiplied. Then when your heart be lifted up, and you, you forget the Lord your God, God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, Egypt out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness, wilderness with its fiery serpents, serpents and scorpions, and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Thank you, God, for this word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that these are not just ancient words on a book, on a scroll, but God, they mean something to us. We pray you teach us and guide us today that everyone is able to focus without any interruptions, nothing confusing anyone yes. or causing sleepiness or distractions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. So we know that uh, Moses was chosen by God to deliver the Jewish people out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. And then he led them into the desert. And while they were there, he sustained them on something called manna. And they re at times they murmured and complained uh, because they were collecting this substance six days out of the week. Uh, it was like a wafer that tastes like almonds, uh, but it would form on the grass or on the, the desert f ground. And they would collect that. And then that's how they lived. Um, but they were in a desert and there were times when they didn't have enough water. It was a hard existence for the 40 years that the Jews were in the in the desert. But God was taking them someplace and they were going to a land of milk and honey, a, a promised land. They were going to the land of Israel. And he was telling them that I'm going to take you in and you're going to win battles against my enemies, against God's enemies. But God was going to fight with them and bring victory. He guaranteed the victory, but the Jews had to obey him and follow and actually perform the battles. And he said that once you get into this new land, you're going to have homes that you can occupy that you didn't build. You're going to have vineyards that you didn't plant. And that all of the provisions that are blessings will be given to them from the hands of God's enemies. And he warned them in this statement here, as I'm bringing you in, don't forget me. Don't forget that I was with you. I was guiding you. I was your cloud by day and your fire by night. And I was the one that provided you the manna. And I was the one that protected you when the fiery serpents were, were biting you and people were dying. And that he was the one to provide these free things. Uh, the grace of God, the provision once they got into the holy land, into the promised land. And that he was also the one who separated them from slavery, that set them free from Pharaoh. There was no way the Jews could get free from slavery on their own without God. And isn't this our situation? That God has come to us. He called us out of wherever we were. And I, I can remember myself before I was saved, wanting to be saved and knowing I wasn't saved and not even knowing how to get saved. And as I've shared with you before, I would hear Christian music and it would just give me a headache. It's the last thing I wanted to listen to. So how do you go from that? And then your desperate knowledge of your sin, and then you don't know the solution. But then the Lord revealed it to me, revealed it to you, and said, this is the way to be saved. And there's a prompting in your heart to give your life to the Lord, to know that you need Jesus and you, 
you might be smart, you might have multiple degrees and everything else, but that isn't going to get you to heaven. And every effort on your own strength to try to, to push through the door of heaven is futile. You can't do it. You can't overcome your sin and your lost condition on your own. But then he reveals himself to you and miraculously through the Holy Spirit, you have the faith to believe. And he'll bless you. He'll bless you in ways that you didn't expect. I've told you guys my story, of course, but how to, I got my job and how I got our finances and everything coming from the poverty that I was in and uh, coming from a family with an alcoholic father. And we were on food stamps. How did I get here? I mean, honestly, it's, it still boggles my mind. But every morning I get up and I thank him. And it hasn't been easy. My job wasn't easy all these years. And even being married is with the perfect spouse that I have <laughs> is, is not easy. Marriage is not easy. But I thank God every morning for Jennifer. I thank him every morning for Monique and Alex and our house and my job and you guys. I do that every morning. And God's warning us, though, the more prosperity that you have and the longer you're on the journey with him like the Jews were, the less you might remember him, the less you might be thankful. It might start to diminish. And that is definitely what I see as the main problem. It doesn't mean that you didn't have an amazing time when you first got to know God, that he blew you over with the baptism of the Holy Spirit or, or cleansing you of some sinful habit that you couldn't break or, or bringing you out of depression in a lost state and knowing how that you're a child of God and, you're, and you're, your destination is heaven with the Lord. But it's easy to forget that. And he warns his people. I kept you alive. I sustained you. All the blessings you have, your degree, your food, your financial, whatever, your healings. I've had miraculous healings in my own body. That came from him. But how quick we are to turn the page and move on with our lives. And we become so familiar with the goodness of God, we forget how good he is. This can happen in our marriages, too, as we've been talking about. You may easily forget. What, remember I told you guys, the good marriages out of that study group. Five positives, one negative. One bad thing that's driving you batty. He doesn't pick up his clothes. He doesn't clean the shower. He doesn't put the, notice I'm saying he, he doesn't put the, the cap on the toothpaste. But what are the five positives that person is bringing into your relationship? You will forget those five positives if you keep focusing on the negative. If you begin to take the other person for granted. I've got him, I've got her. And then, you know, if you begin to think you need more and you're not appreciative to what you have, you will begin to disrespect and not value your partner. And you will begin to focus on the one negative out of the five positives. And I am praying that we all have that ratio, which may not be a guarantee. But that, remember, our marriages depict our relationship with God. And as we can forget the person living in our own house who we see every day, and maybe the person who's making your meals every day or who's going to work and bringing home the cash. It's easy to forget that that's important and it's a valuable contribution. And it's something we should be grateful for. How much easier is it to forget God? Remember, the Bible says it's easier to love the one you can see than the one you can't. And if you can't love the person you're with, how are you going to maintain a love relationship with God? And it, God is not in it on a quick journey with you. He's not in it for the experiences at the conference or the one time here and the one time there. He considers himself married to you. He considers himself in a permanent relationship and he seeks that relationship. This is the amazing thing about God. He values us, which for the life of me, I can't fully understand, even though I, I know what he has told me and what his word says. But the truth is, he seeks relationship on an everyday, continual basis with us. And he knows that we may not do the same with him. Verse 14 and what I just read. Then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
forget him. He's of concern that we will forget him. How many times do we drift from remembering him? This is a conscious effort we have to make every day to remember him, to be thankful for him. And he says in verse 16 of that, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Yes, that's a long journey because he's got to grind us down. He's got to, he's got to test us and he's got to humble us. And that humility part in admitting that we are failed creatures is essential to a good relationship with God and one another. If you think you're right in everything you do, your partner cannot help address your problems and vice versa. Humility is maybe she has a point. Let me examine myself and starting with the word of God. And then I can be humble. Your relationship will last and it will not last if you are so proud and arrogant and you never let your partner speak into your life. And it's the same with God. Moses had a tremendously close, intimate relationship with God. And after he led the people out through the Red Sea into the desert, Moses had a tent. And he called it the tent of meeting. And he would take it outside where nobody else was outside the camp. And he would go out there to meet with God. And everybody else would watch him go. And it says that when he went out to the tent, he wasn't just hanging out with Joshua. He wasn't only reading his scrolls. He was meeting with God. It says in Exodus 33, 9. Exodus 33, 9. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend. A cloud would come down and stand at the entrance of the tent like a person standing there, a cloud. And the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This is the kind of relationship that we can cultivate with God. But I want to point something else out. What was the main thing that made Moses unique? He was Jewish. Okay, they're all Jewish. He was the son of Pharaoh, but he ran away because he murdered someone. So that's not really a, a badge of honor. And he spent 40 years out in the desert herding sheep. Now, none of those things, in my mind, think that that qualified Moses to spend time one-on-one -on -one with God. There's nothing in it. But what God says elsewhere in his word is that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. God loves humble people. I would say I do too. Wouldn't you rather be married to a humble person you can sit down and be real with and talk to? Wouldn't you rather have that in your church than a bunch of arrogant religious wise guys? I don't want to go to church with a bunch of religious people that have no humility. That man, God blesses me and I'm blessed. And you be blessed too. They, they interview some of these football players and I don't know, I don't want to read too much into it. But I remember hearing some of the unsaved journalists say they were talking. OK, I'm an Eagles fan, by the way, Philadelphia Eagles fan. And I don't see any of the knickknacks that represent the Eagles here. So that's sad. But OK, anyway, they're talking to the players and they're, you know, remember, these guys are rich and some of them are purported to be Christian. So the guys are asking normal journalism questions and the players say, I'm blessed. And it wasn't really what the guy asked. And, he, and they're talking to each other saying, I'm blessed. What does that mean? I don't they're going back and forth. So th that's not really a witness, even though the, the player's trying to, to witness, but there's no witness in a nonsensical, uh, it almost becomes arrogant, like I'm blessed, I'm blessed. But let's be real. Let, let's have a dialogue. Let me tell you that, yeah, I, as a Christian, I've got some problems in my life, and here's my real life, and here are the real things I like to do. I'm not going to fake it. I want to have a relationship with you. Well, this is what God had with Moses. And he could talk to Moses. And we see in the conversation that Moses didn't just, didn't just say, God, whatever you say. 
He didn't have that relationship with him. He had a dialogue with the Lord. And if you think about how Moses could talk to God face to face, that's the way you should think about talking to the Lord in prayer. Not a fake Christian. Not telling everybody everything's all right. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, this is Moses talking to that pillar of cloud. He knows he's talking directly face to face with God. And he says, see, see, God, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Is this the image that you get of somebody talking to God who's really talking to God? That you can say that to him. He's being honest. God, you're giving me a big responsibility here. I'm not fully equipped. If you remember the first time he meets God, God said, go and deliver my people from Pharaoh. And Moses says, humana, humana, humma. I've got a stuttering problem. I can't talk to people. And he kept saying, are you sure? What if, what if they don't respect me? What if they don't listen to me? That was his initial reaction to meeting God in the burning bush. He never rolled over and just said, God, I'm, I'm just going to do everything you tell me to do. You know who did that? The Jewish people who never came face to face with God. They were the ones afraid to come near the mountain because it was burning. They were the ones that said, yeah, God, whatever you tell us to do, we'll do. And what happened? They all lied. <laughs> they all sinned. They all rebelled. Not Moses. You've got to have a real communication with God, not a fake one. And that, that is important in your church, in your religious life. It's real, not fake. Don't come and fake me. Don't come and... You do look wonderful, Mrs. Bell. But there are people that go to church and that's all they do. They don't have the worn out Bible. They don't have the testimony. But they want to go to church and look like a good Christian. And that is worthless. That is proud. It's not humble. Humble's coming before the Lord and saying, God, I'm not all I want to be. It's also coming to your spouse and saying, I'm not all I want to be. Have mercy on me. You've got to seek God's mercy and be humble. And then you can talk to him. He hangs around people that are humble, people that are real. I would say, I told you the story about my friend Joe. He asked me what my sermon was on Sunday, but he won't go to his wife's church. Because I sense there's no humility the way she talks to him, the way she lathers on the religion. But when I come to him, I start joking with him. We go back memory lane. He starts talking to me about being black in Pittsburgh 50 years ago and the civil rights movement and his interviews with Jesse Jackson and all of these other guys. And I'm laughing and I'm laughing about the story he told me about uh, Rick James and his daughter. And, and, and <laughs> but you don't, I don't go in there and pretend I'm Pastor Bill. You know, Bill, you know I, well, I read in the Bible today. <laughs> You've got to have a relationship. And then that gives me an opportunity to give him the testimonies and give him the sermon that he won't get from his wife's church. You do the same. I guarantee you will feel better about your walk with God when you're honest, open, and you have a dialogue with him, and he enjoys it. You can tell him about your problems. You can tell him about your failures. And you can't fake anything with him. And God responds, and he says, okay, I'll do that. I'm going to send my presence with you, because Moses said, I won't go if you don't give me your presence. He said, I'll do that. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. What Moses said, not what God said. If you're real with him, he'll listen to you and he'll do, not everything, but he will do things that you ask him to do. That's remarkable. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. Now he's pressing you're going to go with me. But he says, let's see what else I can get out of this. And God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. He has limits. He didn't give everything Moses asked, but Moses asked, let me see. 
How much can I? He's seeking God. He's pressing in. And as he's pressing in, God's saying, I'll do this. I won't do that. But if he doesn't ask, he's not going to get. Doesn't this sound like some other verses in the Bible? If you do not ask, how can you receive? The more you seek him, the closer you come to him, the closer he comes to you. This is what Moses is doing. Alone in the tent. He's not hanging out in the synagogue, in the temple, trying to put on a big show with a robe. He's a shepherd, but he has a communication with God that's man to God, almost like man to man. How much more real does it get? Now, Moses was very familiar with God. He routinely went out and talked to him, and routinely God listened to him, and they had a discussion. But Moses was given a certain instruction by God. The people were thirsty. And he said, where am I going to get water to, to water these people, these complaining people? And God said, speak to the rock. And when you speak to the rock, water will come gushing out. That rock symbolizes Jesus. But Moses was so fed up with the people complaining. And he was so familiar with his friend God that he thought he had the latitude to just lose his temper and take his staff and strike the rock twice. Strike the rock. And water still flowed out. But God said, because you didn't listen to me, you will not pass with these people into the promised land. And Moses did not argue with him. He didn't say anything. He knew he was wrong. And I can see in this the temptation to become familiar with God. He speaks and he speaks and he's blessed us so many times and we had such a good relationship and my life's going well. I got a great job. I got this hot honey with the beautiful hat on over here. <laughs> and, and everything's great, man, because God has blessed me. He healed my liver. And then I just get very casual about my relationship with the Lord. Everything I do, God just gives it to me. I'm just wonderful. I'm blessed. I'm blessed like the football player. I'm blessed. <laughs> and then the football player breaks his leg. And bad things start to happen when you start to become familiar with God. It's amazing because God says, come to me. Come be intimate with me. Talk to me like a friend. But don't ever forget me. Don't ever lose your gratitude. Don't lose the value of our relationship. Don't just use me as Santa Claus to come and bring gift after gift into your life and you can just dance off and do whatever you want. He is not looking for that relationship. And he punished Moses by saying, you will not enter that promised land. And to make it worse, before Moses died, he brings him up to the mountain and he says, take a look. That's all the land your people are going to and you ain't going. And Moses doesn't argue. Moses is still humble to say, I messed up. And we have to be the same way. God is trying to draw Moses back to a place. Humility is combined with fear. He's bringing back a reminder. You must fear me. I am not your little puppy. He's saying as good and loving as I, yes, sorry about those who have dogs today. I am not this little cuddy teddy bear. I am also a lion. He said, you must fear me. And why? He does, it's not that he wants his walking around in terror of him all the time, but he has to remind us to fear him or else the Vietnamese have a saying. If you have, if you get too close playing with the dog and you put your face near their mouth, they will lick your face. I love these Vietnamese sayings, okay. <laughs> it's so true, right? That if I'm too close to the animal, he's going to lick my face. And that can happen when we're so close to God. This is the danger. And then he's going to say, hold on, pal. <laughs> hold on, I'm God. And the reason I'm going to remind you with something bad that's going to cause fear in your life, discipline, is because I don't want you to go the wrong direction. He said, it's for your good. It is for your good. I want God to remind me to fear him as much as I want to love him. 
as you see yourself drifting away, it's usually because you've lost the fear of God. You love the blessings. You love to give your testimonies. <laughs> but what about your fear of him? That's how you know you've lost it when you just go off doing what you want to do. And there's a hardness and a, a searing of your conscience that you, it just doesn't matter to you anymore. You're a child of God, blah, blah, blah. And it's even worse when you start gaining wealth or influence or power or whatever you're after. And then it gets harder and harder. And the disrespect for God comes through in how you're living. And David, these are close men of God. Moses, David, David was a man of God, fought many battles, had a very close relationship with God, as you can see in the Psalms. He wrote songs to God, prayers to God. He's always pouring out his heart, talking to God, just like Moses, pouring his heart out. And then as he becomes king, he's wealthy. He's got all of these soldiers at his command. And then he commits adultery with Bathsheba and has her husband murdered. How? It's because he had lost the fear of God. He could still walk around strutting around. Yeah, God blessed me, made me king. And God was so upset. And notice, God will be upset with us individually because he knows you by name. If you're close to him. And, and God, let me do this real quick. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. Nathan said to David, you are the man. He was telling him, he was talk, telling him a story about a, a little lamb and that the guy had taken the lamb, even though he had his whole herd. And basically what he's saying is, God knows, David, that you slept with Uriah the Hittite. You had adultery with his wife, and he's a little guy, and you're a big guy. And he says, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added to you as much more. Why, God asked through Nathan, have you despised the word of the Lord? Why have you despised me to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. You and I, when we disrespect people and take things for granted and go abusively off into other directions, it is God that we have despised. The God that we may have used to meet in the tent the, the God that we used to talk to as a friend, the God that we've relied on, who's blessed us, who's brought us out of bad things, who's given us a promise of eternal life and relationship with him. We despise him. Just said, I'm just going to do what I want to do. No fear of God. That's when we are in trouble. And God said, what you did in secret, I will do before all of Israel. And he told him that your wives will be raped in public and you will have the sword over your life for the rest of your days. But he also said, David said to Nathan, he didn't say, God, why are you so mean to me? Why is you so bad? No. And he didn't start blaming Uriah. Well, you know, if Uriah were home and not out fighting battles for me, I wouldn't have slept with his wife. Why was his wife out taking a bath on the roof? He didn't do that. David said, I have sinned against the Lord. There was no argument. He quickly repented. And the humility of David was seen right there. And then Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless. The nevertheless part is where we need to be afraid. Even if we are children of God, even if we will have eternal life, the nevertheless part speaks to right now. And he said, the Lord has also put away, say, and you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord. The child who is born to you shall die. His child was going to die. No revocation. He tried to repent. He tried to lay down and not eat for three days, not bathe for three days. And God didn't hear a word he said. 
But he said, I forgive your sins, but not the consequences of your sin. When we lose the fear of God, and God is patient, but there is a point where he's going to say, that's enough. And we have to self-regulate, self-control, so that we constantly remind ourselves that I have to fear God. I have to live in the fear of God while I am still in love with him. Otherwise, there's always the possibility of this punishment that will recreate the fear of God. And it's like, wow, man, I was so lost. <laughs> and now I didn't, take for, I didn't take all your warnings, God, seriously. Over and over again, you warned me and I kept sinning. I kept disobeying. I just got harder and harder towards you. And we just have to remember that he's not a teddy bear to play with. In Jeremiah 5, 22, or 21, God speaks to the Jewish people through the prophet. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps us the weeks appointed for the harvest. And God says, your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have kept good from you. The easiest way to lose the blessings and the joy and the peace in your life is to continue sinning and disobeying God and being rebellious toward him. And that you don't warn yourself that there's a point that God is going to turn against me and the blessings can turn into curses. And it says in Jeremiah 32, 33, they have turned to me their back and not their face. Remember, Moses met face to face. But not when we're on our journey to go and do what we want to do. Not when we just don't care about God. That we don't have any responsiveness to him. He is an afterthought in how we live and how we behave and how we think. Then our back is turned to him. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. He is patient. He's teaching. Every day we should be opening our Bibles to hear this, and it's a warning to us. And coming here on Sundays, there should be a warning in the message to remind us, not just of the love of God, but to fear God. And then our marriages and our lives will begin to be regenerated. We may have backslidden, but just remember the fear should wake us up and jolt us the whole point of the word of God is, is to reveal truth. And truth is to tell us we're off course. Don't treat one another badly. Because God will mistreat us in the end. He will do something to get our attention. And we may not listen. And it's even worse the longer we persist and do not listen. But he says he, he will forgive us. Malachi 3, let me go 13. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of us? What's the point of being held accountable before God and admitting you need his mercy? What's the point of confessing your sins? What's the point of being humble before your Lord? That's what he's saying. Because people say, you have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of keeping our charge or of walking as morning? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Everybody's getting blessed. Why should I walk before God? Why should I? No, let me go and be greedy. Let me go and be just like everybody else because they're getting blessed too. They're getting blessed more than I am. In verse 16, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. If you fear God, he will listen to you. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. No fear, no ear. He's not hearing you if you're not fearing him. 
if you're arrogantly living your life apart from him, he says in verse 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Who's the son? It's Jesus Christ. You walk in fear. You come before God in faith. You receive Jesus Christ humbly. And it is as if you are the son of God yourself that you will be protected by him, but not the arrogant, not the wicked, not those who persist in their own way. And the fear of God brings peace. In Romans 3, 15, their feet are swift to shed blood, in their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Fear God, receive peace. Fear not God and then continue on in your sinful, wicked way. And there is hell in your home. There's hell in your relationship. There's going to be hell in your church. Little pieces of hell because we do not fear him. Don't become too comfortable with him. Psalm 25. I'll end it here with Psalm 25. This, I think we should pray about this today. But let me give you some highlights quickly. David says, and this is most likely after he sinned with adultery and murder and lying. Psalm 25, 4. David says, make me to know your ways. O Lord, teach me your paths. This is exactly what Moses said. He wanted to know the ways of God. And he met with God in that tent of meeting, in humility. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. See, admit you're a sinner and he will listen to you. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. You will never know God. You'll never learn about the depths of God if you are not humble. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. That friendship with God requires this form of honesty and humility. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. If someone comes to you or me with a problem and they are too proud to admit it, just walk away. <laughs> if, if someone comes to me and says, would you pray for me and my husband or my wife? Or, and there's no ownership in anything that has gone wrong. They're not humble. They do not fear God and you and I cannot help them. If, if, if God can't help them and won't help them, you can't. Everything begins with this hum, humility and fear and everything ends with it. And there's no friendship with God without it. And there's no point to go to counseling sessions. 
there's no when someone needs deliverance and they're not willing to confess their sins you you're wasting your time casting these demons out of people we have only to rely on this kind of fear if david and moses could mess up like this and i might add peter when peter's jesus said who do you say that i am and peter's the first one to say you are the christ you're the messiah and Jesus says, yea, God, <laughs> Father God revealed this to you. You're, you're too stupid to know this on your own. And then Peter turns around and rebukes Jesus and says, you can't go to the cross. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Within one second, the blink of an eye, the man who's closest to God all of a sudden becomes too familiar and starts telling God what he should do and not listening. And he has to be rebuked. Get out of my way, Satan. And he'll say it to Moses, David, to Peter. He'll say it to me. He'll say it to you. And then it's time to repent and keep a continual fear of God in our hearts and to remember that we were formed out of dust. We are not perfect. And we all need forgiveness. We all need mercy. And when you're out of step, you only have to go and seek mercy and forgiveness. Ask the Lord to give you a spirit of fear. And, and this is where we get into trouble when on TV and YouTube and certain churches, all they hear is, bless me. Bless me. You love me. I'm great. <laughs> Everything. That, that is not scripturally correct in the Old Testament or the New Testament. And it'll dissolve your fear of God and to the point where you're drifting off into some la-la land, some fantasy Christian world that is, doesn't exist except in the hearts and minds of those that are not fearing God. Walk humbly before your God. And when your partner screws up, as long as they're showing humility, as long as they are seeking forgiveness and repentance, it is advisable to forgive them because you have sins. You have failures. And God is going to judge you. And if you don't forgive someone who's seeking forgiveness, let it be on you. The Bible says he will not forgive those who do not forgive others. But, you know, someone's stubborn in their ways. They won't admit it. They just keep going on. What are you going to do? They have to answer to the Lord. Our Lord Jesus, we pray, God, that we are able to consume this word, that we don't take it lightly. In fact, God, we don't want to take anything about you lightly or haphazardly or indifferently. And God, as you warned the church in Laodicea, if you were hot or cold, I'd prefer you than someone who's lukewarm. For being lukewarm, I just want to vomit you out of my mouth. The lukewarm indifference, the lukewarm lack of concern, lack of fear, lack of accountability, personal accountability, a lack of self-control leads to sin and damages in our relationship with God and our families and our marriages. God, I pray that we each have fear in our marriage, knowing that you are watching and that we are accountable. Fear in our families of the Lord, of you, and in our communal coming together as a Christian family. That we don't just want to stay up late and miss church because we're too tired the next day. That we're going to go out partying and have a hangover the next day. That I'm too busy to go to work to read my Bible or to pray in the morning that I'm too caught up in my own life that I don't recognize the needs of other people, but that I'm willing to be a servant to all, just as you were. And, and Jesus, thank you for teaching us to forgive. Thank you, God, for that image of you dying on the cross when people are mocking you and you turn to our Father and you said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Lord, help us to get to this point to forgive those that have caused this pain. Uh, knowing that we ourselves at times have not had proper fear of you. We pray for a change of hearts and direction, that we're actually changing and seeking that change. And help us, those of us who are stumbling, to live in a, in a fear of you. Day by day, recognizing that you, every one of us, will stand before you, our judge, on the final day. Lord, I pray for those that have become dead inside towards you, that are cold, indifferent. I pray, God, a repentance 
and a flame of fire to burn up inside there to recognize who you are, our God, the one and only God, the one who holds all men accountable, that's slow to anger, and who will abundantly pardon all those who come seeking forgiveness. In Jesus' name, we pray. Oh, Lord God, we, uh, we pray that this, your word, with the help of the Holy Spirit, changes how we view you and, and what we're doing on a regular basis throughout the week and how we're living. Help us, Lord. Help us remind us of these things. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen.